Howdy, 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 and welcome to 16-Bit Science, a YouTube channel that blends my love of retro video games with present-day science communication. Those of you who know me are probably aware of my fondness for cicadas, and so I thought, what better subject for the inaugural episode? Now, this passion project isn't an exhaustive description of periodical cicada biology. Instead, I wanted to focus on some of the quirky characteristics of their evolution and ecology that I feel don't receive as much attention. Still, if you need a little refresher on periodical cicadas generally, I'll give you a brief overview of their basic characteristics, distribution, and life cycle before getting into some of the more curious subject matter. Cicadas are hemipteran insects, which means that they're fluid feeders with piercing sucking mouth parts. There are thousands of cicada species worldwide, but only seven species of periodical cicadas, all within the genus Magicicada. Still, many of their basic characteristics are similar to their annual counterparts. Virtually all cicada adults live for only a few weeks, they're relatively harmless, and individuals are virtually defenseless against predators. While most cicadas are rather noisy, periodical cicadas are possibly the least stealthy group, and this is because they emerge in numbers so great that you couldn't possibly ignore them if you tried. The sheer number of chorusing males that swarm post-emergence can produce calls in excess of 90 decibels. So if they're relatively defenseless, lack the ability to fight back, and make themselves known to potential predators, how are they successful? Well, their massive numbers are like a special defensive strategy. Through predator satiation, the first wave of emerging adults are picked off easily by predators. But as they arrive on the scene en masse, the thousands of swarming individuals overwhelm forest critters. This allows the thousands of survivors to reproduce in their short time above ground before their offspring cozy up below the soil for their big sleep. Now, while all cicadas spend most of their lives in the soil as nymphs, another exceptional feature of periodical cicadas is that they spend either 13 or 17 years underground depending on the species. By comparison, the thousands of other cicada species only spend an average of 5 to 7 years underground. Periodical cicadas are also pretty unique compared to their relatives because they have brood emergences and they're restricted to the central and eastern United States. Broods are basically populations that are spatially and temporally isolated from each other, although there are a few instances of spatial overlap. So, with a 17-year cicada, for instance, Brood 1 would emerge in 2029, and only in a small range, Brood 2 in 2030, in a different range, and so on and so forth for all 12 broods. This is different from annual cicadas, where individuals will typically emerge each year in their range. Now, while I'm sure that many of you have a basic understanding of what the emergence of a given brood might look like, I'll give you the Coles Note version of their life cycle just in case. Cicada eggs are laid in tree branches, and once they hatch, the teeny first stage nymphs fall to the ground, they burrow in the soil, and start feeding on small grass roots. Over the next 10 or so years, they go through a number of molts until they reach their fifth and final nymphal stage. Then, they wait it out until the 17th year comes around by tracking the passage of time through changes in fluid flow. Remember, they're hemipterans, so they feed on plant fluids, specifically the xylem. As leaf set occurs every spring, the cicadas perceive the fluid changes that accompany this process. And for a 17-year cicada, once 17 leaf sets pass, they interpret that as a cue to prepare for emergence. Once the soil temperature reaches about 18 degrees Celsius, or 64 degrees Fahrenheit, they crawl up above ground. The nymphs saddle up on tall vertical structures and split open lengthwise along their backs. Then. The adults emerge all soft and white, with teeny wings, which expand as they pump fluid through them. Slowly, these newly molted adults darken and harden through a process called tanning. With time, they swarm through the forests and fields, engage in a somewhat elaborate courtship ritual, and mate, so that the females can lay their eggs in tree branches again, and the cycle starts anew. But this ties to a question that I don't think gets enough attention. 
Why are periodical cicadas periodical? And why do they emerge after 13 and 17 years? Why not 12 years and 15 years? Well, let's get nerdy with a deep dive into the literature and see if we can figure it out. Now, one theory suggests it's because 13 and 17 are prime numbers. In case you're like me and forgot what a prime number is, it's a number that's divisible only by one and itself. To illustrate why this matters for periodical cicadas, we have to go back into the past, before the last ice age. This hypothesis proposes that prior to glaciation, there would have been a non-periodical ancestral cicada species. But during glaciation, development would have slowed, resulting in longer nymphal stages below ground. Eventually, several proto-periodical cicadas would have developed, each of which would come up from the soil in different emergence cycles. So, a theoretical 14-year cicada would emerge every 14 years, a 15-year cicada would emerge every 15 years, and so on. Now in this kind of scenario, you could calculate the rate of different emergences co-occurring in the same year. And this theory suggests that higher rates would result in degraded genetic signatures that determine the specific amount of time that should pass before a nymph comes up from the ground. This degradation would ultimately cause off-cycle emergences in their offspring. And because protoperiodical cicada populations during glaciation would have been so small, emerging off-cycle would have reduced the opportunity to successfully mate, and would result in the eventual extinction of that emergent cycle. The important thing about prime numbers, for say, 17-year cicadas, is that while they would still occasionally co-emerge with other emergent cycles, they would have the lowest rate of co-emergence amongst all of those considered. So, they would have the strongest genetic signature in their offspring for a given emergent cycle, and the best chances of successful reproduction. But one big problem with this hypothesis is the lack of evidence for hybridization in present-day periodical cicadas. The kind of hybridization that would occur, as suggested by this theory, should result in the presence of two different types of DNA from different emergent cycles in a single individual. And while DNA mixes have been observed in other species of hybridized cicadas, no such evidence exists in the genus Magicicata. But, this emergent cycle hybridization hypothesis isn't the only attempt to explain periodical cicadas' lengthy life cycles. Instead of focusing on cicadas alone, this hypothesis deals more with predator-prey interactions. You see, as unique as periodical cicadas are relative to other cicadas, there are many other examples of periodical insects out there. And one way that scientists have explained their existence is through their relationship with predators or pathogens. If insect density is large in an area, then predators can capitalize on this, causing an uptick in predator reproduction. And if the predator's life cycle matches that of their insect prey, then the prey is potentially at a disadvantage. But, if the prey insect develops a periodical life cycle that falls out of sync with its predators or pathogens, then they gain the upper hand. While it's true that periodical cicadas have plenty of opportunistic predators, they may be able to consistently emerge in such large densities because of their prime-numbered periodical life cycle and a lack of predators with matching ones. But recent research has uncovered a hitch in this theory, and it's a fungus called Massospora cicadina. See, this fungus' spores can remain dormant in the soil and are only known to infect species of periodical cicadas. When nymphs emerge from the soil, they become infected, and as they molt into adults, the infection becomes evident. Bit by bit, the abdominal segments of an infected male flake off, revealing a fungal plug, and ultimately rendering them infertile but the infection also alters their behavior, which leads to greater spread of the infection. The infected males will actually start to interact with chorusing males as if they were females. The non-infected males produce a call to initiate courtship, and infected males click their wings at them, much like a female cicada would to demonstrate interest. As the non-infected males continue with the courtship ritual, they come into contact with the fungus, and the infection then spreads to them too. 
Now, while this fungus has been known to science since the 1800s, there's very little information available about its evolutionary history with periodical cicadas. So, it's tough to say how this impacts the pathogen prey hypothesis for the evolution of periodicity in cicadas. But it seems like these interactions have been receiving more attention in recent years, which means we might be inching closer to fully understanding how and why periodical cicadas came to exist. Disappointing as these conclusions might be, I really don't want to leave you with a pessimistic outlook here. Maybe these imperfect theories are kind of like retro video games. At the time, game developers did their best with the knowledge or technology available to them. And sure, by modern standards, they lack resolution and clarity. But they still served as the foundation for technological leaps we've made in recent years. So, hopefully, these theories can help us to get closer to the truth so that I can cover it in another episode of 16-Bit Science. <laughs>